This is Drom Shakasuto. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe and like this video. So welcome everybody to Controversial Topics with me, Rabbi Yitzhak Michelson, and my holy brother, Rav Dror. And we have a very special guest with us. And I know I, I asked the pronunciation, so I'm going to try my best to remember that it's Danny Vachiana. That's right. Correct? Good. I got, it. I got it right. We have a special guest with us. So we, we were going to do this on our other platform, Restream. And what we titled this tonight was the Black Hebrew Israelite Movement Revisited. Why? Because Rav Jor and I discussed this topic a few weeks ago. And unbeknownst to me, my holy brother decided <laughs> to do a, uh, a debate of sorts with uh, a couple of characters, I'll call them. Um, last every week, time that I'm, every time that I'm jumping into the pool to to save some uh, drowning uh, uh, people, you want me to let you know and to get your approval. Yeah, I, well, I, you, I, I do. No. I don't know how many times a day you're going to get a phone call, though. You, 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 you always like to jump into the deep end. I that I know about you after all these years. Um, so, so I, you know, it, I say characters. Look. It, it, these are people that I've dealt with in the past, and some people might know, of course, Rob Jordan knows that I used to be on staff with Jews for Judaism, and I did a lot of work in the counter-missionary movement. And to me, this is not an unusual thing, because at the end of the day, most of the, most of the people that are involved in the Black Hebrew Israelite movement still have connections to Christianity and still believe in some, some have some sort of belief in Jesus whether they believe he's God or whether they believe he's just Mashiach, the Messiah. But because I because I knew that you you sort of got broadsided by them, because they have a particular agenda and they know very well, like missionaries, they have specific things that they target. Um, Danny was gracious enough to reach out to Rav Jor um, because he, I, I believe, Danny is a Jew by choice, if I'm correct. Um, but he is also somebody who, as part of his journey, um, was in the Black Hebrew Israelite movement at one point until he he finally decided to to join um, the Jewish people. So Rav Jor and I thought it would be a great idea that in our limited understanding of the topic, just based as two Jews that are not Khazars, uh, but, <laughs> but um, that we would have somebody who has a little bit more knowledge than we do about the topic and, and bring him into the conversation. So maybe, Rav Jor, you want to talk about your your little foray into the deep end this past week before general, we hand it over to Danny. In general, so thank you so much for the wide uh, presentation and uh, very <laughs> detailed, and, and it is, and it's enough. And um, we don't need to go deep into what that uh, was in that um, poor conversation. Um, maybe more like an interview or an uh, interrogation, but uh, they were not really allowing me to speak. But um, at least I felt very good with myself to know that I did my best. I know that mm -hmm. I care for people, I care for souls. And when uh, someone is asking me, um, to talk and to explain, most likely I'm going to say yes, unless I feel that that person is like really like um, trying to take advantage of the situation, try to sabotage, to ruin something, to make fun out of me or something that I won't feel comfortable. But because that I know that there is a, um, there is a certain aspect of fear among the Jewish community that been hurt in the past from many kinds, unfortunately, of anti-Semitism. And um, because that I also know that there are souls of Israel, souls of Jewish people who are among the Gentiles and the nations who are exploring and searching, um, as you mentioned before, I said to myself, why not? Like throw yourself into the Nile yeah, there are crocodiles over there. There are alligators over there. 
But uh, we know that Hashem made miracles with the children of Israel, even in the Nile, surrounded with, with, with those monsters. So I said to myself, okay, go into the deep water and just uh, present Judaism as it is. Answer to, to your extent, to your knowledge, to your understanding. And I, I did it honestly. I was just like simply honest. I was not allowed to talk so much. I was uh, interrogated by... Uh, by those guys, but okay, in any case, they did their thing, we're doing our thing. And um, in the next day, I got uh, two emails from two honest people who told me that they watched the, the show um, and that they saw that I was very patient and, and held my spirit and myself and that they felt a lot of wisdom in my words and uh, that it, both of them wrote something very interesting. One wrote a whole message in Hebrew and the other one in, in English. And both said very important, precious things that were similar. And they said that my talk brought them to the desire to search and explore and learn more Torah and more of ancient wisdom. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, mm -hmm. I... I, I gained my share. I know that I did my thing. I got my evidence from heaven, from Hashem, that mm -hmm. I was in the right direction here. The outcome was that I was able to inspire some people with my simple personal talk. And, um, but mm -hmm. like we said, and you have much more knowledge than I even, because I live in Israel. Like for us, even like before we are talking about the Israelites, like something that, in Israel, we don't even like we don't even know like what what what's that? Someone asked me today about Christianity, Christianity, and he told me like, do do you know a little bit about Christianity? So I told him, listen, we're from Israel. In Israel, what that we know about Christianity is that there are Christians, <laughs> and that they are exist. That's what we know. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, like we don't know. We live here already like the forgetfulness the the lack of knowledge that is being passed from one generation to the next like the life experience of my grandparents is not available for me today already it's like only in the books on like this in in reality we're out there like in our homeland we're speaking hebrew we're jewish people we're israelis we're going to the army we're doing this we're doing that like we have some like arguments here with people who claims to be Palestinians suddenly claim for the land as well. Like um, we're we're minding our own business, but because that I b a bit uh, like a, a explored and and been to the world and been five years to the U.S. and met some people and been to some communities, so been exposed to more and more aspects of Christianity and mistakes about Judaism. So definitely, the right thing was to bring our honorable guest and uh, and we'll give him the stage and the microphone like he deserved to to have the great opportunity to speak on our outlets and always welcome to join us. So Danny, it, 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 I'm, I'm assuming, obviously you reached out to Rav Jor based on the fact that you watched the presentation. Um, so what, what what was your takeaway from the whole thing? Have is, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your journey first? Probably would be a good thing. Tell us how you came to where you are today, and and then give us sort of your understanding of the the presentation and, and what you thought. Well, first of all, I want to give uh, respect and thanks to the Steen rabbis. Thank you so much for having me uh, as a part of your uh, show. And also, I want to give thanks and praises to Hashem that allowed us all to wake up this morning. So, can I mean, you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So, I mean, for me, looking back, it was obvious. You know, Yiddishkeit is obviously, Judaism is obviously uh, something really special and unbelievably significant for all of world history. And for me, you know, looking back, this obvious, right? But uh, at the time, I couldn't see that. And I had to go through a process to see that. A long story short, uh, I came out of a group that is centered in Israel, in Demona, but they're in several other cities, and knowing as the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem. That's the official title. And uh, that's Rabbi ben Ami, the late Rabbi ben Ami, And he was our leader. And I didn't grow up in Israel. I grew up in St. Louis. 
And uh, much of my family is still in this group. And of course I have nothing uh, but good things to say about the group. Uh, but ultimately what was lacking, at least for me, was the oral law, the explanations that allow us to understand what the Torah is trying to tell us. For instance, sitsis, we all know these things, sitsis, kosher, how do we understand that we ha don't have milk and meat together? How do we understand how to make sitsis? How do we understand um, that Pesach is not actually on Shabbos, but it, it's actually these different things. We only understand this with the deep, the deep explanations of the sages. And uh, for me, um, that's what I was looking for because we didn't have that. And I was missing that. And once I realized, once I was exposed to it, that was it for me. You know, for me, I had, I have to know more about this. And it's a challenge, it's especially for anyone who doesn't come from that background. It's in Aramaic. It's uh, a certain, certain special way of learning. We understand that this rabbi uh, is overrules this rabbi. We understand this. We understand it's, it's very complex, but it's something that in that learning is found holiness. It's found direction and that different voices all together create kind of like basumim, you know, kind of like uh, in the temple, we have all these different smells and together create something really special. All right, so um, Demona, the group in Demona is sort of not as, from my understanding, is not as radical. I mean, obviously they wanted to live in the land and 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 to a certain extent keep Torah and, and, and so forth and don't seem as radical. So, you know, so how, how do you compare? I mean, you know a little bit more about this. So I understand that there are even like subgroups within the Black Hebrew Israelite movement. There are some that are more, more radically to the side of like we talked about, like their understanding of Jesus and who he is, whether or not they consider him like some in Christianity to be, you know, on par with Hashem Chas Shalom. You know, and then there are those that just consider him Messiah. I, I would assume that the people in Demona are not as radical as the two two gentlemen that Rav Jor, you know, was I like interrogated was interrogated by. I honestly, Achi, I watched for like five or ten minutes and I couldn't take it after. I had to turn it off because uh, it was just too much. But uh, Danny, so what what was your take on their whole presentation? And you know, and and sort of. Uh, the difference between them and and maybe the way you um, came into this. Well, I want to I want to mention two things, really three things, but I'll start with the first thing. You know, uh, that particular gentleman that you interviewed with is one of the most, um, in some way, extreme of all of them. You know, and there's a whole culture of debate, and it's not like debate where you know, it's a civil discourse. Each person gets their five minutes to speak. Then the other person can respond and there's a moderator. It's a sort of a cage fight verbally where you're set up for the fall and then they take you down. And, and if they can't take you down, they'll mute your mic. And if, they, if that doesn't work, they'll kick, you, they'll kick you off the show. And that's kind of their style. And the whole thing is about showing off for their audience. And many... Uh, many, many, many uh, groups work this way, whether it's on the street or it's online, that it's kind of, a, it's not really an open discourse. It's not really a conversation. It's more of a cage fight. And, it, and it's supposed to take you down as quickly as possible. But that's not mm -hmm. everyone. And that's, that's what I want to mention secondly. You know, uh, really the only thing, the commonality, first I want to talk about uh, nomenclature. Black Hebrew Israelite is a term that most uh Hebrew Israelites will find offensive uh, because they say, no, we're not black Hebrew Israelites, we're Israelites. And many of them say that Hispanics are also Israelites or Native Americans or uh, Seminole Indians and whatnot, depending on the particular group. Um, so that brings me to my third, my third topic I wanna talk about. Uh, I'm kind of putting all these together, but the point is that there is no single type of, of Hebrew Israelite. There are everything from people who are essentially Orthodox Judaism, but they're not Jews. And they have a menorah and they light on Hanukkah and they wear a talis and they have a, a uh, Torah scroll and they have what looks just like a shul when you walk in. It looks like a shul. 
And then you have everything from people who are basically Christians, but they say, well, we're Israelites. We're the true Israelites. And then you have people who say, we're also Israelites. You have people say that we are the true Israelites, right? That the Jews are fake. The Jews are Khazars, as you as you've heard. So mm-hmm. there's everything in between. And there is no single, the only unifying thread is that there are people who feel like they have some common descent from uh, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov from the Israelites of the Bible. That's the only common thread. Mm-hmm. But there is something to learn. Um, there is one thing. It's kind of like an iceberg. You know, you have the tip above the water and you have everything down below. And most Israelites, we don't see them. We see the, the vocal ones. We see the street preachers. You know, if you're in New York, you'll see the, the, the ICBK. Uh, you see them out there preaching. Um, if you go to other cities, you'll see them out there preaching. Those are the ones you see. But then there's all these other ones who are quietly going about their business, worshiping God in the way that they feel is most, most appropriate for them. So it's all over the place. The question is, um, do you think that there is uh, some like conversation, dialogue? Is there something that, uh, that we need to do from our end that, uh, that might be useful to, to bring them on board to, to like the way that we understand that real Judaism works with the great um, soul within the body? Um, that refers to the oral Torah inside the, the biblical knowledge. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think the best thing to do is, is what, uh, what the Rob is doing, um, trying to have a conversation, trying to talk about these topics, not only among, um, with people who we don't necessarily consider Jewish, but also people who uh, amongst Jews, awareness amongst Jews that um, everybody heard about the attacks in New Jersey and the horrible attack on the rabbi, uh, I believe it was a Chabad rabbi who was having a Hanukkah party. I believe this was a year ago or two years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, The horrible, we've heard about these things. And part of the message is saying, you know, they're not all like that. That's just the ones you see, unfortunately. There is that stream there, but um, not everyone's like that. And there are many, many people, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, um, a lot of the black people being black is in black American people uh, who come to Judaism have come out of that background. And there are great, great that's, many different types. Yeah, that's important. That's uh, that's important. That was my feeling and that was my understanding when I. I, I couldn't hear you. Did you say something that? No. Oh, I think we had a lag or something. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so that was my approach. That was my understanding. That was my will um, when I wanted to um, to find a way to communicate, to speak. I tried to prepare myself in uh, like emotionally and more like to prepare my mind to the conversation. And I was I was praying for it, and I prepared myself, and I wanted to to explain certain things, but except for bringing like points to debate and argue and to show me that that side and aspect of our Judaism is, is, um, is claiming for being supreme white and that our race is supreme than others and on and on. And like to show like certain things that are like, and, and I, you know, were, were the pro like, if you if you watch the show, so probably you you felt it. It's been built step by step by me not surrendering to their claims. But in the end of the day, there was a certain moment where I tried to explain to them that they are reading from a free translated Bible to English. That that is like almost like reading from the newspaper. Like the distance from the of from from the from the real Torah that was given, given in in the holy language of Hebrew, only to trans even to translate it with the greatest intention of them all and with the greatest will of them all, already going to dra- downgrade the Torah from its message in one thousand levels, and then to do it with a, a with a wrong intention and to twist and and change, and bend the verses. 
to the new idea that you try to present by translating the Bible to a new language, going to downgrade it in million new levels. And just to let uh, some uh, Google translate the Bible, definitely just going to kick you out of the ring. So when they tried to bring evidence from, from free uh, translation of the Bible into English, to deep words of the holy sages that are talking about stains and colors of of, of leprosy, deep sugiot of of of, hmm. of, of halacha, deep deep meaningful sugiot of of gemara of Talmud. When I try just to tell them that's not the way to do it, it's like they already, like you said, um, kicked me out of the of the debate of the one side <laughs> debate that we had before. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so a couple of mm -hmm. things. W one of the things that I, that I want to say, and and Rav Dor and I always say is, and and you and you touched on this before, was the idea that there is no doubt in my mind or in Rav Dor's mind that there are people that stood at Har Sinai with us. Uh, it's very clear in the Torah that it goes. Hashem goes through a whole list and says. You know, after he says you and your servants and your maid servants and your water carriers and your you know your wood choppers and and even those who are not here today, mm -hmm. um, so so for sure we believe that there are people out there. There are there are there are hundreds of thousands of Anusim people that mm -hmm. were were pushed out of Portugal and Spain. Uh, there there for sure the Lemba. And and the Beta Yisrael and people from mm -hmm. Africa that for sure are are part of the tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. We have no doubt in our mind about that. So so here's another interesting thing. I brought this up mm -hmm. several times on this idea of one of the things that I one of the most important words in this conversation is identity. There are so many mm -hmm. people today that are looking for identity that don't have identity. Right. What, I, what I think is weird about the whole thing is that that people who feel marginalized then try to marginalize other people. So they're they're doing the exact opposite of what they want done to them. They feel like they're a marginal, marginalized community. They're looking for identity. And so mm -hmm. the only way that they feel that they can have that identity is to stand on the shoulders and push the other people down and marginalize the people Um and and the third thing that I'll just say is this: that based on that, so it was, it's interesting when they were quoting the Gemarot and and things like that, which I thought it's very interesting that one of the most important things that we know in the study of the Torah is context. Okay, and one of the main verses that they use in support of the idea of the trans transatlantic slave trade and so forth is a verse from Devarim, from Deuteronomy 28, mm -hmm. verse 68. Now, mm -hmm. what they don't That's know right. because of what Rav Jor was talking about, this idea of not understanding the Hebrew and so forth, is that mm -hmm. that very verse destroys the whole theological argument because that verse is talking to a group of people who have left Mitzrayim, who are getting ready to enter into the land of Israel, to Canaan, and Hashem says that I'll send you back to Mitzrayim. And then the very end of that verse says, you will sell yourselves, but there will be nobody to buy you. That's what the verse says, mm -hmm. if you translate to Hebrew correctly. You will sell yourselves, not that you'll be sold. So it, it's it's clearly talking, it's it's clearly not talking in a spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. you, you can't look at all the times that Hashem uses the term Mitzrayim to refer to physical Egypt, the land of Egypt, and then say in that particular verse that it's spiritual Mitzrayim and 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 it's speaking about spiritually the the slave trade and talking about blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. So, well, I mean that's really what it comes down to, in my opinion. You know, obviously there's a spiritual aspect because this is we're talking about connecting to God. Ultimately, this is all about connecting to God in one way or the other. But a big part of it is that the identity aspect. And, you know, you, you mentioned I'm going to talk about, first of all, about a little bit about uh, black history in a nutshell regarding identity. 
and why that's so important. And then I'm going to go to uh, this verse, Deuteronomy 28, which that's such a key. That's the key chapter uh, for Hebrew Israelites, I believe, mm -hmm. in general. First of all, you know, if you look back to Black people, the majority of Black people, as we know, were slaves in America mm -hmm. up until the end of the Civil War. And even a little bit after the Civil War, slavery continued. And then you had sharecropping and so on and so forth, right? Which was basically exactly like slavery. It just was a little bit different system, but it was slavery for all practical purposes, right? So until that time, you didn't really have Black people really having the freedom to search and be what they want to be as far as how they connect to God. They had to accept more or less what was given to them and what was available to them. There's even about there's even uh, a slave Bible uh, where it's kept in a, a uh, famous Black museum where uh, certain verses were taken out and other verses were emphasized in order to back up and promote and, and, and uh, create a docile slavery, a docile slave uh, population. And then you have, uh, you have Black people not being allowed to read and write uh, many times. Uh, slaves were not allowed to learn how to read or write. So anyway, I'm gonna really, really quickly talk about, really, really quickly a key figure, and that's Marcus Garvey. I don't know if you ever heard of Marcus Garvey, but Marcus Garvey was the first person, he was Jamaican, um, I'm half Jamaican, he was Jamaican and he came uh, with the idea of what we know as uh, Afrocentrism, Afrocentric ideas, the Afrocentric identity. Basically, he tied Black people to a particular country, and that was Ethiopia. He said, you know, we're Ethiopians. And that was a real point of pride. He was a Christian. And that was a point of pride because Black people, the biggest problem is that we don't have a clear identity. Who are we? Everybody else in the world. I came from the Philippines, I came from Japan, I came from China, I came from uh, Poland, even Jews, you know, they say, well, my ancestors lived in Poland, but we're Jews or wherever, everyone could tie themselves back to some kind of place, except for black people. Black people don't know where they came from. All they know is they came from somewhere in Africa. And that really is, is a hole there in the soul. Who are we? If you don't know who you are, how do you know what you're supposed to be doing? How do you know what's important to you? How do you know who your friends are? How do you know who your enemies are? And so I, this is my opinion. Black people have been looking for identity since the end of slavery. Of course, there were free black people, but the vast majority were enslaved. So Marcus Garvey came along and said, guess what? You're Ethiopian. And you'll notice the, the earliest um, black congregation. I don't know if you ever heard of a uh, Rabbi Matthew Whitworth. Mm -hmm. um, the, the earliest congregations called themselves Ethiopian congregations. Uh, many of these movements were tied to Marcus Garvey. They were Garveyites. And you had, if you ever heard of the Nation of Islam and Farrakhan, and we all know the horrible things he says. The student, uh, Farad Muhammad, who was the person who founded uh, Nation of Islam, if I'm not incorrect, he was a Garveyite. And most of these early movements were tied in one way or another to Garvey, to Marcus Garvey. And all it's all about the sense of the search for identity. So what I'm going to say is... Um, you know, if we put it in that frame, it makes a lot of sense. Because if you take the average black person, and this is what they do out on the street, if you see the street preachers like ICBK, like uh, IUIC, if you ever heard of these groups, um, they sit on the street, the microphone, hey, black man, you're, is, you're the people that this Bible talks about. And that brings the other point that's really important to know. Black people's identity, in my opinion, is tied up to two, two central themes. Number one, slavery. The trauma of slavery is what created Black people as we know it in America. We were formed in America, and the average Black person has 20% European DNA. And you can, you can guess how that might have happened. Not only through voluntary things, but a lot of involuntary things. Let's just say it like that. So we're not really African completely, but we're not European either. We're this kind of blend, and we don't really know who we are, and we're traumatized. We're traumatized people. And then put all that together, the only thing that keeps us together is that trauma, in my opinion, and the Bible. If you look at the Pew surveys, Black people read the Bible on their own more than almost anyone else. That's not a part of an organized religion. So for Black people, the Bible is central to the identity. And it's not an accident that all these Israelite groups use the Bible in English, oftentimes the King James Bible, 
So it's like if you if you frame it in those two in those two categories, first you have the trauma of slavery and race, which was it was all slavery was all about race because you look one way and someone else looks someone a different way, you get to be a slave and they get to be free, right? And then you have the Bible, and that the Bible, reading the Bible, has been something that kept us together as a people. And then you put those two things together and you can frame almost anything that you see through the black community in that light. And that's why you don't see, like let's say the NOI had the kind of reach that you think it could. It, because at, at the end of the day, most black people, they are connected to the Bible and to the ideas of the Bible and the figures of the Bible. So what am I trying to say? Um, Deuteronomy 28, why is, this, why is this important? Basically, black people have always been trying to figure out why did this happen to us? Because this didn't happen to anyone else. Yes, there was slavery in the past, but it wasn't the kind of slavery that we had where not only are you enslaved, but your children are enslaved and your children's children are enslaved. And even after slavery ends, the stigma continues, right? I don't know if this happened to anyone else quite like us. So I'm gonna read one verse from Deuteronomy 28. It happened to us when it happened to us. <laughs> it happened to us in Egypt and it happened to us um, you know, even in a worse way than that, that we've that we we've been sent to the to to be to be killed to be to be erased from from face of earth you know into into the camps and 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 to complete destruction and like uh, yes we were not even uh, we were not even uh, we were not even considered as as slaves we were we were considered as 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 scum of the earth as 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 source not even not even human yes yes source of diseases and on it's like mm -hmm. so it's crazy but i want to say and I'm yes gonna boy you, let's give you the the ability to continue your your great words no I you're right say, first you're of right. all those are Bro. real beautiful words of wisdom and and I, i'm enjoying and learning from you and very thankful for for your great speech and great talk and i just want to say that from my life experience that is definitely a desire and love for the torah for the bible and a real feeling of attachment to it can can show on a great connection to the soul of Israel, definitely, because like you said, inside of a person, there are many parts for his soul. And as the number of parents that he had in his tree of life, like all his ancestors uh, composed his soul today. If willingly or not willingly, they are his ancestors and therefore they have an impact to his soul. So many of us has Jewish blood, spiritual soul within us or Israeli belongs to the tribes. And it's very common that many people will be holding souls of Israel within them, like without being a known Israeli, without being a, a known and accepted Jew uh, to the Jewish um, population and community. But still he will carry that light and that light is desiring and craving Torah because that, that is his light, Ooh. that is his source of light. So you have some Israeli soul within you and you're not considered Jewish and you're not accepted as a lost tribe. You don't have the, the, the tradition and the story to tell where you came from and where, what your family tree is, but you're still desiring Hashem and you love the Torah and you love... So I, I tried in that debate to, to mention that the real true sign of the children of Abraham is that they care for each other. They are not hating each other. They are respecting each other. And as long as we see that all that love to the Bible bring people to be better people, really to better their actions, so then there is a discussion and we can talk and we can find ways to communicate and to learn from each other and to enjoy each other's qualities but when the discussion becomes to be an agenda a, a, a ring of war then uh, you know everyone needs to protect their lives as well absolutely absolutely i just want to say uh, really quickly like that is true like the jewish people have been through horrible uh things we know the uh kimonoski uh, the uh, massacres, the pogroms, and the Holocaust most recently, um, and other horrible things have happened. Of course, this isn't about um, saying who went through the most pain, but I do want to say that slavery was unique in a certain way 
in that the identity was stripped away as well. The Jewish people, even through all the travails that Jews have been through, I say we have been through because I, as, you know, as a Jew, we have been through as Jews, um, the identity remained. Jews remained Jewish. Jews remained, knew who they were. We're Jews. They kept some semblance of, of either it was Hebrew or at least Aramaic or Yiddish or Ladino. They had some sort of separate culture, separate identity for the most part. Um, they knew who they were. But Black people don't have that, never have, never have had that since, since taken from Africa. Don't know what tribe we're from, what language do we, is our language, who are we? So it's a I little hear. different in that respect. I hear Mm -hmm. but I just want to read this verse so you can imagine black people reading their Bible. And that's why too, why I guess uh, they got very upset when you um, wanted to question their English understanding of the <laughs> Bible, which of course we know that Tyra is, the Tyra is, you, you know, we know this, I don't need to say too much, but for them, that's their connection to God. So if you tell them, uh, you don't even know what you're talking about based on what it says in English, it just, that's their connection that's all in my opinion black people that's all we have in a way is that english bible and we feel like we're reading the word of god and i don't want to speak I, for anyone else but I, the, it's funny i, I want to say one thing it's, it's an obvious thing and it's it's respected and i i i respect that greatly i we're, we're not arguing in any right. way about that this is why yeah. we want to give a chance and this is why mm -hmm. we we call this discussion and this conversation to try to see if there is still a place for a conversation after we've been slammed. Right. I just want to Absolutely. add one more. I just want to add one thing that based on what you're talking about is that the identity is something that was promised through Hashem. I mean, if you look at the prophets, if you look at Yermiahu chapter, I want to say it's chapter 31, you know, very clearly Hashem says that, you know, this is a promise that I give, you know, that the, the sun and the moon, uh, you know, would would disappear before, you know, um, the Jewish people would disappear. So, you know, so it's not it's it's, it's really based on Hashem's promise and nothing else that we've we've been able to keep that identity. But for 100 sure. percent, we we hear what you're saying about the, the uniqueness of the, the, the experience of slavery, for sure. Absolutely. I think there is totally, I think this is the time. I feel like um, there are literally millions of Black people that want to connect to the Tyra. Millions of Black people. And what you have right now is a collapse of the Black church. It's been happening for a long time, but it's accelerating yeah. because you have all the scandals. You have a real, um, you know, lack of uh, respect of the leadership and lack of faith in the leadership. You have money scandals, you have, you know, other scandals, you know, going on and black people are abandoning the church and all they have is their Bible. And so you have them falling into all these different groups. Many of them are, are, are spiritual and many of them are not. Many of them are, some of them are cults. Some of them are straight up anti-Semitic, Jew-hating cults. Um, and if I were to say what some of these camps believe, some of these groups believe, you'd be shocked. It's right out of some of them. And I want to say, like I said before, the majority of them um, are simply looking for connection to God and an identity. And they say, well, we're, we're Jews also, or we're Israelites also. But some of these groups, the most visible ones, say we're the real Jews, like, I, like IUIC, like ISUBK, if you ever mm -hmm. heard of these groups, you can Google them. Um, they say we're the real Jews. Right. Uh, and, and, that's and I don't think, and there, there's never been an argument from myself or of Jor that when anybody says we are also, or we could also be Jews, or we are also Jews. I, I, I'm not going to argue with that. You know, I can't tell you what tribe I'm from. Mashiach will tell me what tribe I'm from. You know, I'm not a Kohen. I'm not a Levite. So, you know, I don't even know what tribe I'm really from, but you wanted to share a verse from Deuteronomy yes. 28. And I know Rav Jor limited on, on time. So um, I, think I, that, that uh, I think that because this um, conversation is going so well, if you won't um, 
mind and if you want to continue talking you can take your time after i i'm off but uh, it's it's your call okay so well, please we're we're hearing well when you ask when you talk to um many israelites and they say well how do you know that you're uh really the people of the book you know you're the people of this book they bring up the curses they say well the curses the curses and I'm going to read a little bit about this in English. I'm not going to try to read it in Hebrew, especially not in front of uh, fluent Hebrew speakers. I don't want to embarrass myself. But uh, I'm just going to read in English. I'm going to read a couple of verses. This is 28, 16. Well, first, I'm going to start with the, the really important verse that they always use, which talks about being taken in Egypt with ships. Now, they say it's, a, it's real ships, but they are metaphorical, metaphorical Egypt. And that's kind of how they, if you look at the verse, it talks about uh, walls. It says uh, you, your walls will be assailed and so on. It's something to that effect. Well, where were the walls in West Africa? You know, where were these walls? Where were the king of, you know, it doesn't exactly fit, but they kind of, they kind of fit it where they need to fit. But um, let's see if I can find this really quick. I actually didn't intend to. Well, 68, do, um, is, the, 68 is the verse on the ships. Thank you. Thank you. You did your research. You did your research. Um, Hashem will return you to Egypt in ships on the road to which I said to you, you will never see it again. And there you will offer yourselves for sale to your enemies and slaves and maidservants, but there will be no buyer. Now, if you read this verse, you know, it said, well, when did, when did black people, when were they taken to Egypt? It's metaphorical. Ships, that's obvious. And then selling yourself. When did black people sell, sell themselves? metaphorical exactly. right so they kind of bend it they kind of bend it and, and use it but they use this verse along with the curses which if you look at black people many black people uh have have had some of this have seen some of this you know a curse you will be in the city this is verse 16 a curse you'll be in the field a curse you'll be in the fruit basket your kneading bowl a curse you'll be in your womb through the ground offspring of your cattle flocks of your sheep and goats but anyway, when you look at Black people in America, uh, a lot of trauma, a lot of trauma, not only in the past, but today. You know, if you go into some Black neighborhoods, not all Black neighborhoods, but many Black neighborhoods, there's crime, there's drugs, there's violence, there's poverty. And if you look at these curses, it seems like mm, it might apply. It might apply. And so you have all this stuff together, Black people stripped of their identity, a Black people stripped of their culture, a people stripped of their language. Uh, people who don't fit in anywhere, don't fit in in Africa. The Africans don't feel necessarily a kinship. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Um, and don't feel at home here in America either. Feel like aliens, a perpetual uh, slave caste, a, a despised class in America, and feeling unhappy and feeling uh, unwanted. And then you have these Bible verses, and then you have uh, you know all this together it makes a, it could be a dangerous brew. But, you know, it, you know I, I brought up early, uh, you know, and it, you know, if you want to continue, um, I'm fine with that. I know Rav Jorah had to get off at 11. Um, so what I was going to say was what I brought up very early on, you know, when I introduced the topic was the idea that many of these groups still have connections to Christianity. And I talked about my counter missionary work. So oftentimes, you know, one of the, you know, one of the things that the missionaries use is Isaiah 53. And, and this very much reminds me of the same way that the Hebrew Israelites, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to try and change my language from now on and not use the BHI if that's going to offend people and just say Hebrew Israelites. But, you know, in the same way, it's, the same way that a Christian missionary will say, well, look at that, look at those verses, who else could this be talking about? You know, in the same way that Deuteronomy 28. But as I said, one of the things that, that I always say is that text without context is pretext. You, you, For instance, like when they quote from the Talmud, when they quote a particular Gemara, you know, as a Jew, um, and hopefully you're learning, we, we all continue to learn, I learn, Rav Jor learns, is that, first of all, when you're going to study the Talmud, 
you have to know what is the Mishnah um, that's being discussed. What's the law? The, the Talmud is made up of, of the Mishnah and the Gemara. So the Mishnah tells us what the law is. And then the Gemara is the commentary of the rabbis that you mentioned that have their different perspectives. And what is it? It's like a diamond being looked at, all the facets of the diamond. And then at the end, the rabbis say, this is the facet that we're focusing on. And this is what the halacha is. This is what we're going to follow after we've looked at it from every different angle and every different facet. So you can't take, like anything, you can't take a particular verse from the Tanakh, from the Torah, and say, ah, I'm just going to take this verse where I'm going to say, well, you know, it's talking about curses and what people are more cursed than we are. For sure, there's no question. Look, I grew up on the streets of Brooklyn, okay? I know what it's like to live uh, in a mixed community. You talk, my, my, the children I played with were Jamaican, my next door neighbors. You know, I grew up in the projects. You know, I didn't live in Israel my whole life. I grew up on the streets in East New York. If you know New York, um, not the greatest uh, place to grow up in, um, but it was mixed. And so I didn't grow up, even as a religious Jew, I didn't grow up with any racism. I had people in my building you know, that were, that I told you, my next door neighbors were Jamaican. We played with them. I didn't see, I just saw two kids that I played with. I didn't see color. My parents never taught us that. Um, so I hear, I hear what you're saying, but I just want our audience to understand that from a contextual standpoint, you know, the Deuteronomy 28 is talking to the people, all of the Israelites who had come out of Mitzrayim, which are a mixed multitude that are getting ready to enter into the land. And Hashem is saying to them, either do this and receive the blessings, but if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. And I'll send you back to Mitzrayim. I'll, I'll, I'll put you back in slavery if you don't want to, you know, you said, nishma. we will do, and then we'll understand. You know, the only people, you know, that said that, We'll do, and then we'll understand. And, you know, Hashem is basically saying, either follow my Torah like you accepted, or this is what can happen. So, again, I want to make it clear that both myself and Rav Jor, our whole purpose um, in even discussing these things is to open up dialogue. We're not looking to dismiss anybody. We're looking to bring people in we realize that the true redemption can only come when um, we follow you, you, Danny, me, and Rav Dror, follow the, the, um, the commandment to be a light to the nations, to all the nations, um, to teach them the proper way to connect to Hashem uh, in order to bring redemption. So... Uh, I'll I'll throw it back to you. <laughs> That's absolutely right, you know, and I think that, you know, there's a there's a famous verse, and uh, I probably should have earmarked it before, but I think it's uh, Zechariah eight and something. But anyway, the gist of it is that uh, ten men of the nation. Twenty three. Twenty three. Wow, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. Um, yeah, they will they will grab the hem of a Jew, and they will say because it says specifically a Jew. It doesn't just say an Israelite. It doesn't just say. I remember I shared this verse with the with the Israelite. They said, "No, you changed it." <laughs> I showed it to him. I said, "No, it says it says Yehudi, mm -hmm. a Jew." It says they'll grab the hem of a Jew, and uh, they will say, "Let us go with you because we heard that God is with you." Something to that effect. Right. And the way I understood that verse is that the ten the ten men are the ten tribes that are missing. Right. They're the ten. They're the ten tribes. And um, that's right. so how there, we have to reconnect. Right. And I think there's no question, you know, as I said, based on, you know, also in Deuteronomy, that whole concept where, where the, that's a very long chapter, you know, chapter 28, you know, that starts off with the whole idea. Like I've often said this, when I grew up, my rabbis taught me that when it says, and those who are not here today, 
that I needed to I needed to live my life as if I was there at Har Sinai receiving the Torah with the rest of the people. But I have taught all of the time that I've spent, you know, in in my years in radio that people know me from and my my show A Light to the Nations and my other shows that I've done and my work with Rav Jor is that we want to see all the people come back. I've worked with Anusim. I've worked with people, uh, you know, that can trace their lineage back. For sure, um, I, uh, you know, I've worked with a group in Africa. Um, there's a, a, a Breslov rabbi, Rabbi Avram Greenbaum, a friend of mine in Yerushalayim, that has a, an organization called Israel Calling, a- Israel Calling Africa. And he works with different leaders in Africa that have now embraced the Torah. I've met people from different countries, from Ghana, from, you know, from uh, from many different country, countries in Africa that more and more of these people are waking up to either, either Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach, the seven laws of Noach, or, you know, wanting to connect more with Torah and, and, and uh, either have found some traces of lineage to the Jewish people through the Lost Ten Tribes, or um, have decided that, you know, Judaism is true for them. Um, I think the other important thing to mention, which you didn't bring up, you you sort of alluded to it, is that when you say that, you the, the you know, the um, the Black people didn't have an identity and and, you know, really didn't have anything of their own, Christianity was pretty much forced on them, you know, in in the movement of slavery when they brought brought over and certainly in America, um, Christian missionaries targeted the slaves. And, uh, you know, you, you have the whole idea of like the Negro spirituals and things like that. I mean, you know, very connected to religion, but it wasn't like they had a choice. Um mm-hmm. To, on what religion. It wasn't like, hey, you know, you get off the ships, you want to pick Judaism, you want to pick Christianity, you want to be uh, you want to be this, you want to be that. This was sort of forced on them. So um, the same way that with the Anusim, that Catholicism was forced on people, you know, in forced conversions. So I think it's important for people to understand that part of the the, the journey of the Black people as well in, in slavery and being forced into Christianity. And you can't have more force than that when you're literally property. You're literally owned. And uh, you have no belongings of your own. Even the shirt you wear belongs to someone else. Your pants, your shoes, even your wife really is the property of someone else. And they can do whatever they want to do at any time. So you can't have more, more force than that. Can't yeah. be more forced than that. And, and, you know, my point is not to say, oh, whoa, is, you know, oh, everybody should feel sorry for black people or, you know, oh, you know, black people uh, should be, um, you know, uh, uh, items of uh, feeling, basically feeling sorry for black people, that everyone should feel sorry. That's not really what I'm trying to say. What I'm really trying to say is that just to understand a black experience. Obviously, I didn't go through slavery. Obviously, no one I know go, have went through slavery. but it's like, uh, it's just something that's there, kind of the elephant in the room. And it's like, uh, I've done my family tree, I've done 23 and Me, I've done Ancestry, and try to find as much as, as my background as I can. My late grandmother, she did a lot of research into our family tree. And she even connected our family tree back to, uh, I don't know how the true this is, but to uh, Anderson Davis, who was the president president of the, of the Confederacy. And Davis is one of the last names that was very common in my family tree, on one of the lines of my family tree. And so there's this whole into this whole uh, intermixing of um, the slave master with the black population, the unwilling black population. And there's whole this whole mixture of Southern culture and black culture because black black culture is for the most part Southern culture. So it's kind mm-hmm. of this whole thing where at the one point you hate you hate what happened. And at the same time, the fingerprints of what happened is all over Black people as a group and who they are as people. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that you'll notice the same thing in Africa, where uh, colonialists forced 
Christianity and punks the, pop, the population there, and you see more and more people are rejecting Christianity in favor of either African tribal uh, religions or Judaism. Yeah, so it's just I, all. I know that personally. It's all a process. Yeah, I know that personally. I've seen that personally because I had very close friends. Uh, actually, um, they um, uh, a couple that I was working with years ago. Um, his father was one of the most famous Christian artists, very very well known Christian artist that ended up secretly sort of leaving Christianity and uh, becoming B'nai Noach um, as a result of interactions with me. And they started embracing Torah, um, but after a few years left that. And then, you know, when you, when you mentioned that the, the, the sort of Af Afrocentrism or, you know, they they then got more involved in that and sort of walked away completely from anything related to Judaism and anything related to Torah and got into this whole, you know, African royalty and and uh, and and which is can, can be a whole different discussion that, you know, would have to be for another day. And maybe that's something that you're familiar with as well. I don't know. But uh Yes, yes, right. actually, I'm not going to go into, I don't want to go into it too far, yeah. but I have an extensive background. Um, that's kind of how I grew up. Um, you know, that's how everything started with the whole Afrocentric ideals. We had a red, black, and green flag. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's the Garby flag growing mm -hmm. up. It was actually red, black, green, and gold. So it was like the original Garby flag. We right. we had, we did a lot of things, but anyway, it's a whole different topic. Right. But, um, right. Uh, anyway, um it's getting late here in Israel. So um, thank you. Um, no, I want to thank you for, for coming on and spending time with us. I'm sorry that Rav Jor couldn't spend more time with us. Um, we appreciate you reaching out to him. And, and uh, after you saw that, um, I can understand why you would want to sort of, you know, give your perspective and, and clear the air a little bit and, and, and give us an education. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you your willingness and your your openness to share and you know it certainly gives not just us but you know the audience some some things to think about when it relates to that we certainly want to be open to other people's perspectives and uh and so keep in touch and uh um it seems like we can't we've tried as much as we've tried to get away from this subject um um somehow Hashem keeps bringing us back to it. So anyway, Danny, well, thanks you again. Know, that everything should lead to Mashiach returning soon. That Amen. we should choose the Geula. And Amen. we should be able to see uh, the temple rebuilt speedily in our days. Amen. Amen. Thank you again. Be well. Shalom. Amen. Everyone. Be well. Thank you so much. Shalom. 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 Thank you. Emuna Project is a non-profit organization. To support this work, please make a purchase from our online store or donate through emuna.com. Thank you. My new book, Return to Your Root, is now on Amazon and emuna.com.